First Thessalonians chapter four, and we'll stand for the reading of God's word. Verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Let's ask the Lord to bless his word. Our Father, thank you, Lord, for this text that's before us this evening. As we think of uh, the coming of the Lord and the rapture of the church and when he'll come and receive us onto himself. And Lord, that's what we're looking for every single day. Lord, in the morning, I remember Pastor Rock would always say Maranatha. In the evening, he'd say Maranatha. He was always looking for the coming of the Lord. And I pray, Lord, that we'll be the same today. That we'll recognize that the Lord's coming is soon and that he could come at any moment. And I pray that we'll be looking for him. I pray that as we consider this text this evening, I pray, Lord, that it will just minister to each heart tonight. And I pray that it will bring the comfort, Lord, that it's written to do, as it says in the text, to comfort one another with these words. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Please be seated. Where do you go for comfort? Where do you go to encourage your heart? Where do you go when the world gets dark and scary? Praise the Lord for a Christian. We have a book we can turn to. We can go to the word of God. In our text, we find that Thessalonians are sorrowing. They're grieving. This is actually, now we're coming to the purpose of the letter. We've noticed that in this letter, Paul hasn't had a right to the Thessalonians to tell him, you need to get this right. You need to get that right. It's not like the letter to the, Thessalon to the Corinthians where they had lots of problems that he was addressing. No, the Thessalonians, they were a good church. They were a church that was faithful, a church that was serving the Lord. But they had a question. They were confused about the doctrine of the second coming of Christ. And so when we come to this passage of Scripture from here to the end, this is what this letter was all about. That's why from the beginning of the book to the end of the book, you see in every single chapter some reference to the second coming of Christ some reference to the fact that he is coming again and the assurance that he's coming for you. And that's why we've called it blessed assurance. And tonight, as we look at these verses, we see that they are sorrowing. You know, we also got to remember, you say, why were, they, why were they so confused? I'll tell you why they were so confused. Because they had never read 1 Thessalonians. <laughs> because they had never read 2 Thessalonians. Because they lived in a day when the only New Testament books that had been written up to this point were Galatians and James and perhaps one of the Gospels was actually written at this time. And so they didn't have much to go by when it came to understanding the truths of the second coming of Christ. And so Paul wrote to them by the word of the Lord, this message of comfort that brought them hope. We find in verse 13 that they're soaring. What are they sorrowing about? But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. They're sorrowing about their lost loved ones. They're, they're not their lost loved ones. They're loved ones that had gone on before. There were members in that church of Thessalonica that had passed away, members, good standing members that had, had gone home to heaven. And they weren't sure what was going to happen to them. They weren't sure what the future held for them. But Paul wrote a message of comfort. For a Christian, we don't sorrow as the world. We still sorrow. It doesn't say that you don't sorrow. It's that our sorrowing is different. We sorrow not as others which have no hope. 
for a Christian, we have hope. Our hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Apostle Paul, you know, he lived in the day that was like the day we live in. He lived in a world that had no hope. A world that was hopeless. They were lost without God. They were without hope. I'm told that a typical tombstone in Paul's day bore the inscription, I was not, I became. I am not, I care not. In fact, it also is reported by archaeologists that they've dug up first century cemeteries in Greece and Rome and have found many of the tombstones that bear the Greek or Latin inscription for no hope. They had no hope. They lived, they died, and that was all they had. But 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18 tells us that for a Christian, it's different because we have a hope a hope for the future, a hope for a hope in Christ. And tonight, as we look at our text, we find the comfort that God gives us concerning the future and concerning those who have gone before. And it's found in the word of God. You notice the text. What does this text say? It's talking to those that are sorrowing. And what does it say in verse 18? Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. This message from the word of God, this letter that Paul wrote to the Thessalonians was a message of comfort. It was to comfort their hearts. They were sorrowing, but God comforted their hearts. Look to the word of God and find his comfort. I, I want to consider tonight as we look at this passage of scripture, how these words comfort. What about these words is it that brought comfort to the Thessalonians that brings comfort to us today? Well, first of all, it's very simple. There's a comfort in the return of Christ. There's the comfort of the return of Christ. The fact that Jesus is coming again, that brings comfort to the heart. Verse 13, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus, will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Before we even get into how this text relates to us personally or into the different statements made in this text, let's just take comfort in the simple truth that Jesus is coming again. That is our hope. The text tells us that the Lord himself, not somebody else, not an angel, not a representative, the Lord himself, this same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. This same Jesus, he's coming again. And that's our hope. That's the hope that we look for every day. That's what Titus refer, Paul refers to in Titus 2.13 when he says, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus is coming again. And that's our hope. Listen, our hope, our comfort, we're not comforted thinking that the governments of this world are going to figure out it, figure it all out. Our hope isn't in universities. Our hope isn't in the institution of man. Our hope isn't even that the church will one day result, will be so effective in carrying the gospel that all the world will be saved. No, our hope is in Christ and his return. Our hope is in him. He is our hope. And our hope isn't that man will somehow progress and create some sort of utopia where all his problems go away and man lives in peace. No, we know what's in man. We know that at his best, man is altogether vanity. Our hope isn't in man. Our hope is in Christ. It's in his return. Imagine trying to comfort the Thessalonians by saying, oh, it will all get better one day. Don't you worry about it. One day we'll all figure it out. The world is getting better and better. Don't you know that? Really? No, they were persecuted for their faith. And the Bible says, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, 
we are of all men most miserable. Our hope, our comfort is not to be found in this life or in earthly things. Our comfort is in the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. J.C. Ryle said, I believe it is for the safety, comfort, and happiness of all true Christians to expect as little as possible from churches or governments under the present dispensation to hold themselves ready for tremendous convulsions and changes of all things established, and so to expect their good things only from Christ's second coming. Now, what's your comfort? What's your hope? Looking at this world and men failing and wondering what in the world is going to happen next? Who can solve all these problems? Who can bring peace? Who can get us out of this mess? It's not going to be found in a man. It's going to be found in the Lord Jesus Christ, the God-man. He is our hope. And we find comfort knowing that Jesus is coming again. This text brings comfort in the second coming, the return of Christ. Secondly, it, it brings comfort in the truth of the resurrection of the saints. The passage is that the Thessalonians are sorrowing over their, lost, their, their loved ones that have passed away, thinking that they would somehow be prevented. That's the word it says in the text. Verse, uh, verse number 15, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. And what the word means there, the word prevent, is the idea that they would arrive before them. The word prevent is in the text isn't saying that they wouldn't be, re, be present. It's just saying that we'd get there first. Those who are alive and remain would get there first. And they wouldn't get to, they were afraid that their loved ones wouldn't get to experience all of heaven that they'd get to experience. They're afraid that their loved ones would somehow miss out on the crowning of the Lord or something to do with the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ and his coming. And they were confused, you know, they, they, knew that, they knew that the dead would rise, they, they knew that Christ was coming again, but they didn't know all the details, they didn't know all the timing of the events and different things. And so they were wondering what was going to happen next, when would the dead raise, and, you know, perhaps they thought he, they wouldn't be raised until after the millennium, perhaps they thought it wouldn't be till another time, but the answer was given that they'll be raised at the same time that you meet Christ. In fact, the dead in Christ shall rise first. I don't think they're going to miss out. Don't think that they're going to be left behind. No, the dead in Christ, they rise first. You know, I, I actually, I, when, I, when I think of the loved ones that I've lost, I think of Man, they, they, they're getting such an advantage right now. <laughs> the idea that they would miss out. No, knowing what the scripture teaches, I'm just like, man, just think, but Joel Michelle, my, my friend Joel, he's been in heaven for how many years now? And he's seen so many different things. Got to, got to, got to walk the streets of gold. And, and, uh, and I, I, and I, I, uh, I haven't. <laughs> he's got a head start. <laughs> he's got a head start on me. And this text isn't teaching soul sleep. This text, is when it says that they sleep, it's just referring to their bodies. Their bodies sleep. Their bodies are asleep, but they, they're absent from the body. They're present from the Lord. The Bible says that to depart and to be with Christ is far better. If Paul had, a, if, if, if there was just soul sleep and nothing that happened after a person died, if they just literally, their body went to sleep and so did their soul, it wouldn't be far better. It still would have been better for him to abide in the flesh, which was needful for the Philippians. But no, it was far better because to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. To depart and be with Christ is far better. And you notice in the text that it's telling about these ones that because Jesus died, that's not the same for us. Do you realize that? The text uses the word died, but it doesn't use the word died for you and me. It uses the word died for Christ. For believers, it never says that we die. We, we sleep. We sleep in Christ. And it does say the word dead, dead in Christ, but they that sleep is often used for believers. Can't say never, but it does refer more often than not to the fact that believers sleep in Christ. 
because Christ died. He tasted death for us so that we don't have to die. So that a man, for, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. You know, the word perish, the idea of dying, being lost forever, the idea of being eternally separated from God, the idea of going into a place called hell. You know, the Bible teaches that for a Christian, a Christian has eternal life. And yes, a Christian's body will fall asleep, but the Christian lives forever with the Lord. And he, his, his soul is directly goes absent from the body to be present with the Lord. Christ died. He died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. He died. He gave up the ghost. They buried him in a tomb. And yet the Bible never uses that word for us. In John 11, Jesus said, He that liveth and believeth in me shall never die. You know what that means. That's why Paul uses the word sleep. It's to emphasize the fact that you know, sometimes, sometimes people sleep for a little longer time. <laughs> sometimes a person might have a long sleep. Well, eventually the Bible teaches that when a body dies, it, it's like Lazarus was asleep for four days. Well, it depends on when you, you die compared to when the rapture is for how long your sleep is. But it's not the same as dying. Is that body will wake up. It will rise again. And for those who go to sleep, we have comfort knowing that the dead will be raised incorruptible on that resurrection day. That's our comfort. That's our hope. It's the comfort of the resurrection of the saints. You know, my father, he... He had cancer for 10 years, and he, uh, for the last 10 years of his life, he, he was hardly happy, you know. He was constantly in pain, constantly, constantly, you know, if he bent down and bent, and, and he just he, it killed his back just to bend over. And he was constantly going to the hospital twice a week for treatments for his cancer, and just didn't live a happy life. But, you know, that day, his body, when it would be resurrected, there would be no cancer there. There will be no pain there. It will be raised incorruptible and be raised like unto his glorious body. And that's our comfort, our comfort of the resurrection of the saints, our comfort of the return of Christ and the comfort of the resurrection of the saints. Then the third comfort here, there's lots of comfort in this text. Number three, the comfort of the rapture of the church, the comfort of the rapture of the church. Verse 16 again, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. The rapture of the church. You'll often hear Christians talk about the rapture. And you say, but I never see the word rapture in the Bible. Well, you don't, but you do all at the same time. The word rapture is the English word that's taken from the Latin word, which is taken from the, from the word in our text, the Greek word, caught up. <laughs> Shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. Verse 17, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. The Latin word there is rapizo, which means, which is rapture and referring to our, the rapture of the church. And the word rapture caught up here in the text literally means to snatch away. It's the idea of grabbing something out. It's the word rapture. And it's how the Bible describes the day when Jesus comes to meet his people in the air, the rapture of the church. And can I just remind you that this event right here, this is the next event on God's calendar. This is the next one. We're not waiting for Russia to do this and that and that, and then the rapture will happen. We're not waiting for uh, the, 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 next, the next pandemic to start, and then the rapture will happen, or the, whatever. We're not waiting to see Antichrist appear, and then the rapture will start. No, we're waiting for Christ. He could come at any moment. There's nothing that has to happen that stands between him 
and the rapture. He said he could come at any moment. And while we can look out at the world and we can realize that things are getting closer, we can realize that the day is approaching. We, we can realize that the world is as, more set up for the return of Christ than it's ever been before. But the prophecies that are in the Bible that are to be fulfilled, they are prophecies that take place after the rapture, take place after the church is snatched away. And next week, as we consider 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, which talks more about the second coming of Christ, we'll look at just the reasons why we believe that the Bible teaches that the Christian is caught out before the tribulation begins. And we believe the Bible, the Bible teaches that Christ could come at any moment. We say it's imminent. The Bible says that his coming is at hand. And it's true, you know, Russia is in Bible prophecy. I, I've been thinking about preaching on Russia and Bible prophecy one day, and I'm sure I will at some time soon, but just so that you know what the Bible says about Russia. But the fact is, any prophecy about Russia in the Bible is about Russia and Israel. That's what the prophecy is about, not about anything else that has to do with Russia. And we talk about the coronavirus. Was that prophesied. The Bible speaks of pestilences in the tribulation period, but when you read the prophecies of the Bible of pestilences, it's far, far greater scale than anything the world has seen up to this point, even with the coronavirus. And the next great event in Bible prophecy is the one in our text. It's the rapture of the church. The rapture will happen followed by a seven years of tribulation, which begins when Antichrist makes his covenant with the nation of Israel for seven years. It's the beginning of the 70th week of Daniel. He'll break off that covenant in the middle of it, and the last three and a half years will be the worst. But at the end of it, Jesus returns with his saints to execute judgment and to set up his millennial kingdom. He'll come with his saints. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, he's coming for his saints. And this one, he's coming for us to take us to himself in the air. But the, uh, the ones that speak of the setting up of the millennium, he comes with his saints who are already with him. And his feet don't come up in the air, but they stand on the Mount of Olives. And he sets up the millennial kingdom. And next week, Lord willing, we'll consider why it is that we believe that the rapture precedes the great tribulation my mom at mission mark works at with a you know christians from lots of different stripes and there's lots of i guess pentecostals that work there and they're all saying that the first seal has been broken and this is all happening and no it, it hasn't but the bible teaches that the rapture is next and the tribulation starts doesn't start until that man of sin is revealed the antichrist the only way I could ever be convinced that it's different is if I, the Antichrist is revealed and I see it, you know? I guess if that happened, I'd admit that maybe I was mistaken. But until then, I'm holding to a pre-trib rapture of the church. And it's a comfort to us to know that we're going to be taken out of this world. We think of the, the tribulation that's coming. Christ will come and snatch us away before it comes and we'll go to this meeting in the air you see in the text for the lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout that's that's a command that's like when he stood at lazarus's grave and said lazarus come forth only this time he'll say it to all the dead in christ come forth and all the living come forth come come up hither it's how it's stated in revelation 4 with the voice of the archangel, Michael's the archangel, he'll be speaking then too, calling, calling out something. And with the trump of God, trumpets in those days, they, they used trumpets for uh, to calling the people together. They used trumpets in the wilderness to go forward and to go on a journey. They used trumpets all these different occasions. I, I want to read you what I have there because I like what I have there, but I don't know where it is, but they have trumpets for, oh, there it is. <clears throat> the trumpet 
It's throughout the scriptures. They're in the Bible, they use trumpets to declare war. To, they use trumpets to, for, to announce special times and seasons. They use trumpets to gather the people together for a journey. The Romans used trumpets to announce the arrival of a great person. And when God gave the law to Israel, the event was preceded by a trumpet blast. And it all relates to the rapture. The trumpet will be an announcement to the world of the great tribulation, the changing of the times and seasons. For the Christian who hears the trumpet, the trumpet will be a call to embark on a journey to move out of this world and into the heavenlies. It will be the sound of the trumpet to tell us that Jesus is there and we will listen to his command. And what a comfort it is to know that Jesus is coming and at any moment he could snatch us away and we'll go to heaven and be part of this meeting in the air. Those loved ones that have gone before us will be caught up together with them in the clouds, together with them. I had someone say to me not, not too long ago, I don't know why you guys are always talking about the meeting one another in heaven, having this reunion time in heaven. I don't want to have a reunion in heaven. I, I just want heaven to be all of us. I, I believe heaven's just going to be you're in Christ and that's heaven. He's like, well, the Bible, that's the comfort. The Thessalonians are grieving that they've lost their loved ones. And it says, listen, you're going to be caught up together with them in the air to meet the Lord in the air. And that's a comfort to us. And, you know, maybe you'll have, maybe today you have bitterness and you some people you don't want to see. But that day that bitterness will be gone and you'll be over whatever it was and you'll be happy to see them, you know. <laughs> and it'll be a comfort. But it's a comfort to be forever with the Lord and comfort to meet one another. The rapture of the church, it's a comfort a comfort to the heart. And there's the comfort of the return of Christ, the comfort of the resurrection of the saints, a comfort of the rapture of the church, a comfort of the reunion of the family of God. But then there's one more thing this evening as we come to the end of the text. And can I tell you, this is the, this is the best comfort of all. It's the comfort of being forever with the Lord. The comfort of being with Jesus forever and ever. What's the last thing that's said before it says, comfort one another with these words? It says, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. My mind goes back to John 14, when the disciples heard our Lord tell them that he was going away. And you remember how Thomas, Th Thomas is the one that was so, was so sad. Lord, we know not whither thou goest. How can we know the way? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. It's in that passage, he says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there ye may be also. We'll be with him. We'll be with the Lord Jesus Christ forever and ever. And that's the best thing about heaven. You know, we, we talk about the crowns. We talk about the streets of gold. We talk about treasures. We talk about the mansions that are being prepared. We talk about all these things. But really, the greatest thing about heaven is Jesus. That uh, Jesus is there. We talk about heaven as if as if we're going to spend our eternity in heaven. That's how we refer to it. Refer to it as a location. And one day when we all get to heaven. But heaven's not a location. At least not the way we use the word. Heaven's a person. Heaven is Christ. The fact is we're going to spend more time on this earth than we are in heaven. When you read the Bible, it teaches there's a, a thousand year millennial reign here on the earth. That new Jerusalem comes down from heaven onto, the, onto earth. We're going to spend an eternal day in this world, on this recreated earth. But it's not about where you are. It's about who you're with. In heaven, you're going to be with Jesus forever and ever and ever. And that's what makes heaven heaven. That's what makes it so wonderful. That's why we can't wait till we get to heaven is because we're going to see Jesus face to face. The old saint was not far from the gates of heaven when his pastor came and 
And, and he, looking down tenderly, tenderly upon him, he said, I'm not going to weary you now, but I'll read you the sweetest verse in the Bible, and then we'll pray together. And he opened his New Testament and opened to the 14th Gospel of John and read, In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And he was closing the book and about to kneel in prayer. The man said, don't stop there. That's not the sweetest verse. Keep reading. And so he kept reading and he said, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there ye may be also. And at that, a beautiful smile came on that old saint's face. And he said, that's it. That's the sweetest verse. It's not the mansions. It's himself I want. It was so sad. Jesus was going away. But the promise was, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. So shall we ever be with the Lord. It's the comfort, the comfort of the saints, the comfort that we'll spend forever with him. The comfort of the, the comfort of the word of God. It comforts us that Christ is returning, that the dead in Christ will raise, that there will be a rapture of the church coupled with the reunion of the saints and the comfort of being forever with the Lord. And the greatest truth is this. It's for everyone who believes on him. Everyone who believes. You notice that in the text, verse 14. For if we believe, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. He won't leave anybody behind who's believed on him, who's put their faith and trust in him. You know, sometimes people get can get scared thinking that they missed the rapture. You know, if I showed up at my grandparents' house and I saw they weren't there, and I saw just a pile of clothes on the floor. I'd be thinking, what did I miss? <laughs> there was a man that was the, that was the camp director at a, at a Bible camp, and he left the camp for an errand or something. He, when he came back, the campers had staged a rapture, and what they had done was they had left all their, the clothes in various places around the camp and making it look like they had been raptured out, and the camp director had missed it. And uh, you can imagine how shaken up he was, thinking that he had missed the rapture. But no, you don't have to worry about missing it if you've put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. All who believe on him, all who believe, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And when he comes for his own, he won't forget you. Uh, we were singing that song that Brother Chun Tang sang. I or chose. I, I had to. I had to write down the fourth verse there. I, was, I don't know if you noticed. I started jotting with a pen quickly, but that fourth verse says, "He is coming again." Is the promise to disciples when he went away, and like manner as he has gone from you, you will see him returning someday. Does his tearing cause you to wonder? Does it seem he's forgotten his own? His promise is true. He is coming for you. God is still on the throne. God is still on the throne, and he will remember his own. Though trials, distresses, and burdens distress us, he never forsaketh his own. God is still on the throne. I never wrote down the chorus. You can tell. <laughs> He'll never forsake his own. But it says, his promise is true. He will not forget you. God is still on the throne. God is faithful. Jesus said he's coming again. He's coming again. They wondered in the New Testament whether or not he was coming. They, they were wondering if he'd come the first time. He came right when he was supposed to come. When the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, born, made of a virgin, uh, born under the law. And another time, now he'll come again. Just like he came the first time, this same Jesus will come again. And he's coming for you if you put your trust in him. Our Father, I thank you, Lord, for this text that we considered this evening. Lord, it's so encouraging, such a comfort to know that Jesus is coming again. I pray, Lord, that 
that will be our hope. That will be our focus today, that we won't get distracted by the things of the world around us, but that we'll be looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord, that we'll be faithful to him until he comes. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.